I am directionally challenged. If uh, Jory and I go someplace new and we drive out, uh, we come to a stop sign or a, uh, you know, a, 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 a light, and I can turn right or left, more than often I will turn the wrong way. Um, I practically always uh, drive using Google Maps, not just because I want to know how long it's going to take me to get there, because I don't want to get lost. On a vacation a few years ago, our family was at the beach, and uh, I went up to the hotel room for a little bit, and, you know, I, I took out my key, and I couldn't get the door to open, you know, so uh, I'm working on it, you know, you know. You know, uh, you know, you know, and I finally I decided I was go I go back to the to the main desk and say I need a new uh, uh, room key, and then I looked up and I saw I was on the wrong floor. <laughs> I mean, uh, if birds had my sense of direction, they would spend winters in our Antarctica. <laughs> can you relate? Uh, of course you can. Uh, we've all rubbed our chins, if not at blind intersections, at least at the crossroads of life, we've wondered, should I date this person? Uh, should I marry this person? Uh, what college should I go to? Uh, what should my major be? Uh, should I take this job offer? Uh, should I stay at this place of work that I'm really not enjoying too much? Or should I move on to something new? Should I take an offer I received to, that would require me to locate to a new city or should I stay here in Portland? Should I move out or should I stay at home? Should I rent or buy? How should I raise my kids? When Jory and I got married, I had worked in Young Life for six years with high school kids. Jory was just becoming a school teacher. I thought having kids, you know, that'll be a piece of cake for us. Then we had children. <laughs> I mean, if our fifth son had been our first, he would have been our only son. <laughs> Don't let his pictures fool you. He's cute, but I mean, he had ants in his pants. <laughs> he was super hyper active. First 17 years of our marriage, Jory stayed at home. And then uh, she began to write books and began to speak at conferences and uh, she began Kidspire. And she said, Ron, I can't get anything done with Mark. I mean, he's just all over the place. And he would he write on walls with crayon or, or permanent marker. And so we made a deal that I would take him with me every place possible. So I'd take him to his soccer practices, his games. I would take him shopping with me. I would even take him to weddings and funerals at the church. I mean, that's a scary idea. Taking a super hyperactive kid with you to a funeral where everybody's somber and who knows when he's gonna jump out and scare somebody. One morning I came down and uh, Mark was sitting in the family room. There were five peach pits sitting on a pillow. And uh, he had, on the couch, he had peanut butter and jam and honey. I said, Mark, what are you doing? We don't eat in the family room. We eat in the kitchen. I mean, he was just making this huge mess. One day he locked himself in the bathroom for quite a while. When he came out, he had a scissors in his hand and his hair looked terrible. <laughs> so we were asking all the time, God, how do we raise these kids? One of the biggest questions is how can I know what God wants me to do? Whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, parent, or teenager, married or single, you want to know what God wants you to do. David asks it. This is the 15th in our series of messages 
called after God's heart. In the New Testament, David, or God says of David, he is a person after my own heart. We're thinking, how, how can that be? He ordered a, 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 a census uh, on the number of soldiers against God's command. Uh, he committed adultery with Bathsheba. To cover it up, he murdered her husband, Uriah. Say, a man after your own heart, God? Are you kidding? And so we've been learning that to be a person after God's own heart does not mean that you're perfect. But it means when God convicts you, you confess it immediately. And you get back with God. We've also learned that David focused not on his problems, not on his enemies, but on God. He didn't focus on Saul, his enemy, or Goliath, or the Philistines, his enemy. He focused on God and said, God, I need your help, your power. Last week, we saw that one of the marks of being a person after God's own heart is to trust God with our finances. And David gave, was extremely generous in giving to God. Now today we see that a mark of being a person after God's own heart is to go regularly to God for guidance. Micah talked about this a couple weeks ago, that David brought his needs to God in prayer all the time. David teaches us in our text today, turn to God for guidance at blind intersections. David does. When King Saul died and his son Jonathan, David had been anointed to be the next king. Now his options are open to him. But before he steps up, he looks up. In the course of time, David inquired of the Lord. This is after Saul has died. Shall I go up to one of the towns of Judah? Remember, he's been on the run, a fugitive. The Lord said, go up. David asked, where shall I go? To Hebron. The Lord answered. We find this same process over and over again. David makes a habit of asking God before making decisions. When David learned that Saul was plotting against him, he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod. David said, Lord God of Israel, your servant has heard definitely that Saul plans to come to Cala and destroy the towns on account of me. Will the citizens of Cala surrender me to him? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Lord God of Israel, tell your servant. And the Lord said he will. Again David asked, will the citizens of Cala surrender me and my men to Saul? The Lord said they will. So David and his men, about 600, left Cala and kept moving from place to place. When Saul was told that David escaped from Cala, he did not go there. David puts on the ephod, speaks to God, and receives an answer. Then David said to Abi Arthur the priest, this is another occasion, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abi Arthur brought it to him, and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. Then in 1 Chronicles 14, Chronicles is like a parallel uh, uh, book with, uh, you know, with Samuel and Kings. So David inquired of God, this is still another occasion, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, go, I will deliver them into your hands. So David and his men went up to Baal per Perizim, and there he defeated them. He said, as water breaks out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods there, and David gave orders to burn them in the fire. Once more, another time, the Philistines raided the valley. So David inquired of God again, and God answered him, Do not go directly after them, but circle around them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move out to battle, because that will mean God has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as God commanded him, and they struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Gezer. Josephus, a historian, 
in his antiquities gives this in incident more intrigue. He writes, the king of Israel inquired of God again concerning the event of the battle. And the high priest prophesied to him that he should keep his army in the groves, called the groves of weeping, which were not far from the enemy's camp, and that he should not move nor begin to fight till the grove should be in motion without the winds blowing. A tree's moving without the wind blowing suggests God's supernatural involvement. Time and again, David requests the ephod. What is an ephod? Why is it so effective? Do they sell them at Nordstrom? They were first worn by Aaron, the brother of Moses, the high priest. Uh, they're white vests with threads of scarlet and gold and blue and purple. A breastplate uh, bearing 12 precious stones. Two of them are diamond-like, called Urim and Thummim. How did it work? No one knows. Uh, did it shine brighter when God said yes? While we speculate on the technique, we don't guess at the value. Wouldn't you love to have one? When not sure what to do, David put on the ephod, asked God, and God would answer him. Am I now the king? Yes. Where should I go? Go to Hebron. Will Saul come after me? He will. Will the people of Cala turn me over to him? They will. Should I pursue the enemy? You should. Will I overtake them? You will. Wow. Wouldn't it be great to have God do the same thing for us? Wouldn't you love to have an ephod? Who's to say you don't? God hasn't changed. He still promises to guide us. I think there are at least three things you can do to seek God's guidance. One, meditate on God's word. Meditate is more than simply reading the Bible. It's to think about it. This is why I encourage you to use our journal or some other kind of journal, something that help you, con don't just read the Bible and then close it, but to think about it. And so if you use the journal, you get to write in response to verses you read. Many times the, the thing you're supposed to write is just writing out a verse. I find that so valuable to write out what God's word says and it causes me to think about it. By the way, we have new journals uh, today, so uh, pick one up as you go out. Our hosts will hand one to you. This takes us our new series starting the week after Easter. Um, these journals are written by Chris Quinn, our youth pastor, his wife Lindsay, uh, Kristen Hayward, and Dan Sides. Uh, so, uh, so, so grab one of those on the way out. Hebrews 4 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The Bible is like a scalpel to do surgery in our hearts. Proverbs 2, we read, My son, if you accept my words, words in the Bible, and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. When you spend enough time in the Bible thinking about it, you come to just kind of know what's right and what's wrong, what's wise and what's unwise. Two, consult a person who will give you wise counsel. You're in a church, consult it. 
You aren't the, you aren't the first one to face the problem that you're facing. Others have asked your question. Seek their advice. Most people do not give unsolicited advice. You have to ask. I would dare say we probably have three dozen men and women in this church who are walking oracles of wisdom. But they're not going to come up and just talk to you. You have to ask them. Then they're happy to share with you. Dr. Ernesto Ciroli, founder of the Ciroli Institute and an expert on economic development, learned the hard way that you have to ask questions. At a TED Talk in 2012, he told the audience that most people in economic development really didn't know what they were doing when they started. He got his be a start at age 21 working for an Italian NGO. And he said the, the first projects they did, all of them failed. The first one was working with people in Zambia, southern Zambia, and they, they were helping them grow tomatoes. And they grew tomatoes and they were beautiful. And, 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 he, and he said to them, see, see how easy agriculture is? And they, they grew big and red and delicious. And then one night, 200 hippos came in and ate everything. He said, my goodness, the hippos. How come you didn't tell us? They said, you never asked. That's why we don't have any agriculture in Zambia. Is your marriage tough? Find somebody that seems to be in a good one and ask them. Do you have an important business decision to make? Find someone that seems to be successful and ask their advice. You don't need an ephod to consult. You have God's family. You have a Bible? Read it. You have a family of faith? Consult it. Three, ask God for wisdom and then listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. James, Jesus' half-brother, says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. God loves to give wisdom. First Kings 3, this is Solomon, David's son, now, Lord, my God, you've made your servant king in place of my father, David. But I am only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. So give your servant. God asked him, what do you want? I'll give you what you want. He says, so give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to, to, to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Solomon asked for wisdom and God gave it. So how do you hear God's wisdom? Some people have turned the whole process of uh, discerning God's will into silliness. One woman received a uh, pamphlet in the mail advertising a tour of the Holy Land. She had always wanted to go to Israel. And so she was instantly interested in it and read through it and she had the money. She had the health, she had the interest, but how could she know if it was God's will for her to go? And she molded over her mind and just couldn't be sure what God wanted. So one night she went to, went to bed and looked at her clock and she spent the whole night tossing and turning, wondering, is it God's will for me to go this trip to Israel? And after a nearly sleepless night, 
she woke up and she suddenly knew for sure God wanted her to go. She was certain about it. How did she know? Well, the night before, as she was looking at the pamphlet, she saw that they were going to be flying on a 747. And when she woke up, her digital clock said 747. I mean, that's unbelievable. To make a decision based on something like that? Some people want to take away your freedom by suggesting that God will show you through signs like a digital clock. That's craziness. God has given you freedom and he has no intention of taking away your freedom. He gives you lots of freedom to make decisions within his grand design. But God does communicate through what I call promptings of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah writes, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. If you have invited Christ to be your savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within you and he prompts you on how to make wise decisions. Rather than looking for a sign like 747 on your watch, I believe the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to make wise decisions. Just look at several of these in the New Testament. This is Jude, one of Jesus' half-brothers. Dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, that's what he thought he was going to write about, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. He felt compelled by the Holy Spirit to write about something else. Luke, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Luke wrote one of the four Gospels. Luke writes this as well. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. This is James, Jesus' half-brother, talking to Gentile Christians. So we have the first Christians were all Jewish. Then when Gentiles began to hear about Christ and give their lives to Christ, the whole question was, how are we going to put these two groups together? Are there certain things new Gentile Christians have to believe from the Jewish faith? In order to be real? And here's what James says. We decided not to burden you. Or it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following request, requirements. You are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from meats to strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. We're not going to burden you with a whole, the whole deal but do these four things if you want to get along with Jewish Christians. Luke writes again, after all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. How did Paul know it was God's will for him to go through Macedonia to Rome? He just decided through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, another occasion, if it seems advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. He did what seemed advisable. Philippians, this is Paul, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus. How could he know what is, if it is God's will to send Epaphroditus or not? He decided it was necessary to send my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. And then Paul says another time, so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. How did he decide what to do? He did what he thought best. You ask, how do I know what God wants me to do? 
When your mind is filled with the scriptures, from regularly meditating on them, reading them, and you're talking to wise people, and you're listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, you just do what seems right. You make decisions. You don't wait until you hear an audible voice from the Lord. Often the price of inaction is greater than the cost of not making a decision. Even in the face of incomplete information. You read the Bible. You seek input from people you think are wise. And then you listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and then you make a decision that seems best to you. You have a Bible, read it. You have a family of faith, consult it. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, listen to his promptings. Father, thank you that you are wise, all wise, and you want us to be wise, and you're happy to give us your wisdom. So help us to spend time in your word. Maybe some of us here are, just haven't been doing that. Help us to carve out a little time every day to meditate on your word. And we have a church. There are people here that would be happy to Give us advice, help us to consult, ask questions. And then help us to become keen at listening to your Holy Spirit. Little promptings the Spirit gives throughout the day. I want you to talk to God for a minute. Maybe you've got a decision you're wrestling with. Ask him to help you to be wise in making it. You talk to God right now. Thank you, God, that you are more than happy to give us your wisdom. You made us this beautiful universe. You want us to thrive in life. You want us to make good choices, not bad ones, and help us to consult with you, your word, other people, and listen to your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.